Hello everybody and a really warm welcome to this online session here at the King's Fund. Today we're going to be talking about public and patient engagement, we're going to be talking about where the NHS is now in terms of engagement, talking through some examples of where it's working really well, but also thinking about some of the challenges around engagement. And then we'd also like to look forward and think about what we'd like the NHS to do in terms of patient and public engagement in future. I'm Lily Wenzel, I'm a Policy Fellow here at the King's Fund and I'm delighted to be joined for our conversation today by Mark and Samira and Dan and Neil and I'm going to ask each of them to briefly introduce themselves now. Mark. Yes, hi, I'm Mark Doughty. <coughs> I work in Leadership and Organisational Development here at the King's Fund. I'm also the Director of the Centre for Patient Leadership. And my name is Samara Benomar. I'm Head of System Change working on Integrated Care sy Systems in North West London. And that's the North West London collaboration of CCGs, which is eight CCGs in North West London. I'm Dan Welling, Senior Fellow here at the King's Fund, uh, with a special interest in this area. And I'm Neil Tester, I'm Deputy Director at Healthwatch. Uh, Healthwatch is the independent champion for people who use health and social care services. There are 152 local Healthwatch right across England, and our job collectively is to make sure that people have an influential voice in shaping health and social care and also generating a culture where it feels okay to speak up and it feels useful to uh, decision makers and to clinicians to really listen to what people are telling them. Well thank you to the panel and thank you to all of you for joining us, our online audience. It's great to have so many people joined up, signed up. I know that we have people from a really a uh, wide range of backgrounds as well as members of the public. We have people from NHS organisations, from local authorities, from voluntary sector organisations and many others. It's great to have all of you and I think we're in for a really interesting discussion. I just wanted to say a few words on how the session will run. So we have about an hour and I'm going to start by putting my own questions to the panel just to help set the scene and to get the conversation going. But I'd like to use the majority of the time to ask, to ask your questions. So please do send them through. You should be able to see at the bottom of your screens a, a box where you can type your questions at any time during the session. And they will come through to me uh, on a screen in front of me. So if you see me looking down, then that's why. And I will do my best to pass as many of them on as I can to Mark and Samira and Dan and Neil. So I think that's everything and we can get started. Mark, I wanted to start with you. I wonder if you could just help us set the scene a bit for the discussion t today and tell us why it's so important that we, we talk about these issues. Yeah, I'll set the scene from the perspective that I bring to this conversation with my colleagues, which is um, I'm going to be bringing the co particularly the perspective of the patient and uh, the service user to this conversation. Um, I live with a number of long-term conditions and this has influenced my relationship with the healthcare system over a number of years. And um, I think the one thing I take from that experience and my work with patient service users and healthcare professionals is that patient engagement and involvement is absolutely key. It's critical, essential to the delivery of good quality care and, um, and uh, supporting the well-being of our communities. Um, we know it's central because it's there in the constitution. It's there in the NHS values talks about putting patients at the centre of everything we do. It's there because it talks about organisations needing to be accountable to patients and communities and the public. And it's there because it tells us in the constitution that it's about collaborating and working in partnership with others. It's also there in the 2012 Health and Care Act, which uh, makes it a strategy duty for organisations in the NHS to uh, um, work with patients and uh, the public and it's there in the five-year forward view which actually had a whole chapter talking about new relationships with patients and communities and it's one thing to have it there in writing it's another thing to translate it into practice and that's the challenge there's a and that's what I'm really looking forward to having a conversation with my colleagues about how can we really support that going forward thank you and so Samira obviously the the, what's happening in practice is the difficult bit, but I wondered if you could say a bit about what you think needs to happen in practice. So if I, um, uh, in a similar way as Mark, if I actually um, said set the context within which my work 
um, took place. Now, um, if you look at the title Head of System Change, it doesn't say much. The reason we, we looked at, has, uh, at system change was very much about um, the, what Mark mentioned around creating a new relationship or establishing a new relationship with our communities and our frontline staff and the wider system. Now, my perspective and our organisation's perspective is very much around um, integrated care system is about population health. So if it's about population health, it's not only what happens within NHS or, uh, or social care organisation, it's what happens in the community. Um, very much if you look at what the Health Foundation uh, uh, report told us about what makes us healthy. 10% of what impacts on our health happens in healthcare and uh, setting. 90% happens outside. Now for us to actually work on that and work on that and to make sense of that and th implement that requires a shift in how we think it's uh, about our communities a shift in how we think about how we relate to our patients and a shift in how we create a shared narrative that will enable us to create the transform transformation for integrated care system so in work talking about public and patient engagement what we're keen to do is actually to have a different conversation and create space that nurtures a different narrative that connects individuals to their own well health and well-being stories connect communities together around the shared narrative but also connects communities to us as a system thank you and so Samira talked a bit about some, the shift that we need to see. Dan, I wonder if you could say a bit about, from your work, where you think the NHS is on engagement now. I think, as with lots of things, it's, it's a very mixed picture. So I think we've been looking across different areas and we're working with Samira and others to look at, well, the extent to which this is actually happening. Um, and as you might expect, there's areas where there's really good practice, where you feel that the voice of patients and users is really being heard, being listened to, and that listeners, uh, patients and users are becoming much more part of designing services and setting up health, which is mm. beyond just the service. What can we do as communities? But there's lots of areas where it still feels in this area it can be tokenistic. It can be that in lots of areas where there's lots and lots of information being collected, but there's a question mark over the extent to which it's being listened to. And I think that's a real challenge for the NHS. There's huge numbers of initiatives, both locally, nationally, in different organisations. But what do we do with all that? I think that's where there's a significant question mark. And Neil, so Dan gave a really good sense of the variation that we see out there. Some areas doing well and maybe others sort of a bit further behind. What do you see as the role of the national bodies in, in, in encouraging engagement in the NHS? So I think it's really important, I mean, particularly now when some really long-term decisions are about to be made, that we build this in at the front end of decisions, not in the, the classic case of a, a rushed consultation at the end of change programmes, and also uh, that we see this as something that just becomes part and parcel of planning and implementing and reviewing services. So um, uh, a lot of the things that, that my colleagues have said really resonate with the, uh, the thinking we've been doing at Healthwatch about uh, what arguments should we be making as NHS England and NHS Improvement put together the long-term plan for the NHS. And I think one of the, the key opportunities for us is for this to be seen as a systematic process, not a set of um, individual initiatives that have to be done to tick a box, but something that there is a shared interest between individuals and communities and services and systems that's in everyone's interest to get this right and make this part of how we do things in health and care in England. Thank you. So I think all of you have sort of touched on a bit around the processes and the how. We've had a, a question in from Emily Reid, who's in Harrogate and District NHS Foundation Trust, and she asked the sort of difficult question around how do we reach out to patients and members of the public who are typ typically difficult to engage with? It takes time, which NH NHS staff don't always have. Mark, I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. <clears throat> I think... Uh I think the first thing I would want to reflect on is, is why is it difficult to engage with them? So it's not, it's not a challenge, is it Emily? It's not a challenge to Emily as in, it's, it, it, it's a question to support her thinking, to maybe reflect on why is it difficult for you to work with these particular groups of people? 
and to identify why that's the case. And uh, it's, for me, if we reframe it about building relationships, if we look at it about if I want to involve and bring in different groups of people that we don't normally work with, we might need to go outside what we are normally used to in order to engage with them. So we might need to find people who have close connections to those communities, who are a conduit, a bridge, community leaders, um, people like that, who we can go to in order to have the conversations in order to find ways in which we can work with them. And Samira, I wondered if you had uh, any thoughts. So, 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 so that question comes up time and again, and I can understand the, the rationale behind it, but I also want to challenge back and say that actually um, where we as organisations are very difficult to engage it, uh, with, rather mm -hmm. than actually our communities who are very uh, difficult to engage with, um, in systems where people, where you see engagement that is reflective of the diversity of our population and the needs of our population, are systems that are closer to their communities rather than act the other way around, where we ask our communities to become closer to us. So I think we need to almost flip the coin and say to what extent, if we begin to ask our, ourselves, to what extent are we closer to our communities rather than to what extent uh, uh, our communities are closer to us. Um, it's interesting because if you look at the makeup of our different committees, our PPE committees, our patient groups, our PPGs, our, our, our lay uh, partners, they are very much, those in those groups are very much actually speak our language as organisations. They are as close as you can get to our um, systems. So it does make us then wonder to what extent are we recruiting in our image mm -hmm. rather than in the image of our communities. And I think it's just something to be mindful of uh, and to begin to question. I don't have the answer. What I have is just more what questions we need to ask to get us to the answer. Neil, you were nodding there. Do you have the answer? Uh, I don't have the answer, but I have a, a, a clue, perhaps. So uh, I think part of the part of the answer actually is in the the question. I think people, the more people start to ask the question, why are we struggling with this? That's where creative ideas yeah. will come from. Uh, really agree with what Samira was saying, but just one example of how it's possible to do this in a way that doesn't mean you have to come up with something that literally nobody's ever thought of before uh, is uh, currently online. Um, I think you'll be able to find this on the NHS website. There's a great little video which Health Watch Oxfordshire were part of putting together uh, about the Luther Street practice in Oxford who have completely uh, turned around the way they uh, do all of the same formal public and patient involvement processes that other practices do, but do it in a way that means that they are driven by and continually involve homeless people in all those processes. Um, it took them a bit of time to do it, but it didn't take a whole load of resource or brain power that other people haven't got. So one of the, uh, one of the ways we can make this easier for people is to make uh, information sharing and sort of knowledge transfer easier across the system anyway. And that, that's a challenge for every single subject in, in health and care, but it's part of the key for this one, I think. Thank you. Um, and I think we, um, we've had a really good question here, which actually gets us all to sort of take a step back and think about what actually is patient and public engagement. And this comes from a student from Derby Grammar School. Um, what, you know, what is patient and public engagement in terms of GP practice? What does it actually mean and what are the challenges with it? Dan, I wonder if you could start us off on that one. Yes, that is a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's lots of discussion often about terminology and there's the word engagement, we have the word involvement, then there's lots of other techniques for, for understanding users. I think the example, I try and answer the question by giving an example where they're doing it yeah. um, and then work backwards. So we're doing some work with Wigan Local Authority and uh, what's really interesting there is that for everyone, so this is a big part of this and I think this is a discussion we can have like whose business is this, everyone that works at Wigan Council as part of their induction training has a part of it which is called the deal training which is about how do you go and have that conversation with communities and users and they do the training and then they go out and have those conversations and for some people it's more comfortable than others, but what we learned up there was that for everyone, there's a benefit. 
So for me, it's hard to understand how you run a service without understanding, listening, and involving users of that service. So whether we use engagement or involvement or participation or many of these terms, and they all have good meanings, for me, it's about you have to understand users. That's it. Mm -hmm. And that's at the heart of it. And that's where I think many parts of the NHS are some way away from that, partly because of some of the comments that Samira and Mark have made about routes through. Uh, that sometimes we, just to, on that point, the NHS and the social care system can make it hard to engage because it's not thinking about what's the best way. And again, so for example, the King's Fund has things like the GSK Impact Awards where we work with lots of small charities. They already have roots into some of the populations which are traditionally known as hard to reach. Mm -hmm. So it's about working with partners in the local area, but at the heart of it, it's about how can you not understand. So uh, almost to give an example, uh, Michelle Dixon, who works for... Uh, Imperial Hospital um, spoke about the fact that they've got a, a unit there called the Ambulatory Emergency Care Unit and that's an example she gives of that's where they just haven't engaged with patients because that's not the name you'd come up for if you'd worked with your users. <laughs> Great, thank you. And so we've had a few questions around um, how to engage the public with some of the changes that we're seeing in the NHS. So a question about um, from Helen Bell in South East Clinical Senate. Um, how can we support people to understand the changes that are happening within STPs and ICSs? And Dan, I'll come to you again because I know that draws on some of your work, but I wonder if you could start by just telling us all what STPs and ICSs are. So uh, STPs are uh, called sustainability, sustainability and Transformation Plans. So there's 44 areas in England. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those are moving on to what's called ICSs, which is Integrated Care Systems. So I think even the terminology shows you that we're probably not great at explaining this. Um, but at its heart is a relatively straightforward concept, which is actually within an area, we all, see, we all will receive care at various points in our lives through GPs, through hospitals, through community services, through social care. But at the moment, those organisations aren't working necessarily together. And it's really interesting when you speak to patients often, it's not about individual satisfaction with services. So we could often measure whether the experience with GPs was good, bad, indifferent, same with hospitals. When you speak to patients, often what some of the challenges are are between those services. Um, and actually the idea of something like an ICS, an integrated care system, is if you put the patient at the heart of that system and then work backwards, you'd end up with a better system. And I think that's where Samira is getting, which is are we asking the right questions sometimes? So the more we ask uh, people about their experience with the individual services, we're not really understanding their lives, their lives beyond the interaction with individual services, and Samira mentioned population health. So again, that word sometimes means, some people say public health, and um, there's lots of discussion on the terminology, but it's about, there's lots of things that determine our health. Mm -hmm. And if we're really gonna improve health outcomes, we need to start understanding those. So I think just to come back to the question, that's a really good example where perhaps the NHS could have done more work with users to think about what that terminology mm -hmm. means. Great, thank you. And Samira, did you want to add? Yeah. So I think, um, uh, how do we engage people in the STP or ICS agenda? Do we really want to engage people in the STP and the ICS agenda? How meaningful is that as an agenda? As, a, as, a, as somebody who lives with a long-term condition in a particular area, does it, what does it mean to me? What does it matter to me that actually kind of we're trying to engage people around uh, 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 an idea and a strategy? Integrated care happens at community level. People are making sense of the way we, we try to uh, commission and deliver services. They're already integrated in their communities, in their networks. They actually work together. They kind of make sense of housing and health and social care. So they're already doing it at grassroots level. It's just how we can learn from the way they make sense of integration at grassroots level. Um, and uh, almost um, equally at a uh, frontline uh, uh, staff level. Frontline staff understand integrated care, understands the frustration of integrated care. It's just to what extent we're giving them permission and a sense of agency to act on what they see 
is the challenge in their system. So I think it's really important to frame it the other way around. I mean, we, we have, just to give an example, a local example in, uh, in Northwest London, we have the Community Champions Programme. And um, it is uh, 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 what you might call an asset-based model that actually really looks at working in collaboration with communities. So it's communities who define what needs to happen. And in all the eight years that's, um, that's uh, established, at no time have local communities come up and said we want something that that's different from what our public health uh, uh, data says. So I think communities know and understand what a good integrated care system and they do it day in day out. So I think we need to flip the question around what we think uh, 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 we should engage people around the STP ICS. You know, I want to engage them because I'm in the system and it's meaningful to me. But uh, I wonder to what extent it's meaningful to communities and frontline staff. Okay. That's really interesting, and, and that's sort of the way in which we engage patients in some of these changes is it's actually come up a few times, and, and Neil, there's a specific question around, you know, what is the role that we'd like to see lo local health watches in integrated care systems in the, in the future, and that comes from Matthew Parrott, who's in Health Watch in Surrey. Hi, Matthew. Um, there, there is a really important role for, for Health Watch um, in these broader geographical discussions because one of the... Uh, one of the really valuable things that Healthwatch are able to do is to look at things through the eyes of people. So there's no distinction in the Healthwatch world between health and social care, and there isn't in real people's lives either. There are just all of the different services and the support that you need. Um, they're also really interconnected with the wider voluntary and community sector in their localities. Um, I think one of the real challenges that some of the uh, the early conversations about these broader plans have had have been the uh, difficult relationship sometimes between uh, the NHS and local authorities and perhaps sometimes the NHS not being as good as it could be at recognising the strengths around uh, community development type approaches in local government and that strong sense of the importance of democratic accountability in local government. Um, so there's a beautiful example actually in uh, Healthwatch Surrey's neck of the woods that they have been involved in. The, the Surrey Heartlands uh, <coughs> partnership uh, has got all of those people around the table. There's a formal role for local government there. Uh, they've worked very actively with their Healthwatch to bring real people into each of the work streams developing and implementing their combined set of changes. Uh, but they've also uh, through that joint thinking realised that they needed to completely transform the way they have an ongoing conversation with their wider public and making sure they're getting to people in every single postcode area across that patch and I know that's now starting to uh, make them think differently about the way they engage their staff across all those organisations as well. So um, Healthwatch can be a real catalyst in helping people think differently the other really important role for local health watch is something we're going to be supporting health watch across the country to do as the long-term plan is developed and then as local versions of it are developed through into next year is to make sure that people uh, are developing and delivering the plans are able to make use of what people have already been saying so we've we've taken tens of thousands of people's experiences of primary care into that work stream for the plan tens of thousands of people's experiences of mental health into that work stream and the same for a lot of other things and I think you know starting from where people are in the way that Samira was describing and then showing how your plans are picking up on that thinking and those experiences and then continuing to involve people through the rest of the journey is something that you know for me is part of the prize of the next 10 years of the plan and something that we're very ambitious for our network to do its bit uh, to make happen because it's a our biggest opportunity to start to change the culture around this engagement and involvement agenda. Yeah. And you talked there about an ongoing conversation and you talked about the importance of listening to, to, to patients and public and making use of that. Mark, we've had a question on how do you develop a meaningful feedback loop for patient groups from Eliza Hinchcliffe in South London and Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust. And I wondered if you had any thoughts about sort of that ongoing conversation and how we, we demonstrate to patients that we are listening. Yes, I, I'm, I'm just very conscious sitting here and, and being part of this conversation of um, basing that conversation in, 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 in what does it mean? What is it true? One of the things that I'm really conscious of is
the, the clarity around what do we actually mean by engagement and involvement. So I'm going to bring that back because that's really important for me. What do we mean by engagement and involvement? And I think that's a conversation that we all need to have to be really clear. And for something to me, it's a, it's a, it's a reframing process. It is about the relationship. It's critically about the relationship and it's about supporting people to think differently and see differently what it might mean to work with and be involved with and partner with and collaborate with their patients, their service users, their communities. Therefore, in, in order to get a feedback loop, um, which is, I'm assuming, what is it, Eliza? What, she, what, what she's meaning is, we want information coming back to us about what we are doing in order to know that we're on the right path. Um, I, I, the, the first thing I would do is, again, I know it sounds like a broken record, but I would A, be really clear about what it is we are trying to do. B, work in partnership and collaboration with the people that you are engaging with to understand what it is they really want and come up together with a solution of how you can learn and identify what works and doesn't work. So the feedback loop is developed in consultation and co-produced, developed with the people that you are working with. Mm -hmm. and, and picking up on, um, I think one of the points that we touched on earlier, there's a question, isn't there, about how do we, how do we engage with a wide range of people. We've had a question from Rachel Brown around, who says, PPI groups tend to be largely retired individuals from more affluent backgrounds. Do we have any tips? Do any of the panel have any tips, perhaps starting with you, Mark, on how we can, can collect more diverse views? Firstly, the, the people who are involved in working, developing the engagement, the involvement with their communities needs to, they, this goes back to what we were saying again, you need to think differently. Mm -hmm. You need to, you need to uh, think about where you might go in order to find people who are really interested and involved. And Samira mentioned something really critical at the beginning. We have been doing it for years out there in the communities making things work to support our health and well-being because for many, many years it hasn't been joined up, it hasn't been integrated. There have been fantastic services, there have been small pockets of joined up, supported, integrated services, but when they're not there, the communities have to come together to make it work. Therefore, reflect on that, reflect on where you might need to go in order to find it, it operating in your communities. Local support groups, charities, um, health and care, third sector organisation, they will all be operating in your areas. And they'll be the areas that, th they'll be the organisations and the groups who will tell you where to look and where to go. I think sometimes the danger is because we're so used to in the NHS doing things in a particular way, it can create blind spots to what's right in front of us at times. Dan, do you have some? Other yeah, thoughts? I mean, I agree with that. I think the only thing I'd say about the, the sort of that question about the PPI is it's just a danger of sometimes dismissing the people that do want to give their time. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's a good challenge, but we often talk about who do you represent? Who do? And it's a really thorny issue. So is a patient leader representing other people? Are they there representing themselves? Are they representing the the, the community at large? And these are really difficult questions, yeah. which are good to go through. But what I would say with PPI is not to dismiss people that are willing to give their time and effort. But that being said, there's a, there's a decent challenge there to say, and I think this is one that Healthwatch are working on, is Healthwatch is representing uh, a, a, a community, an area. How are they collecting some of that feedback? Which So we went to, a, just to give you an example, um, there was someone, we're working with West Yorkshire um, in terms of some patient engagement they're doing. And they had a, a patient at one of the meetings we, were, we went to, and this patient had gone away and worked with a number of users within the area and come back with that feedback into the meeting. And they were from the background that perhaps is being referred to there, but they'd taken the effort to go and find out range, views from a range of people. So we, I think it's about not dismissing, mm -hmm. 
but also looking at some of the challenges that you can do about how do you get to a wider audience. Samira, did you? So it's an interesting question around how we engage with people uh, from uh, particular communities or from diverse communities and, and those that reflect the diversity of our population. Um, I just want to give the example. So, um, um, when, uh, so when we had the tragic events of Grenfell, um, um, it was really interesting right at the beginning to what extent actually kind of the diverse community came together to support each other and to support us to support the wider community and there was absolutely no sense in terms of lack of engagement or lack of wanting because we had a shared agenda uh, there was a shared urgency of wanting to actually and, and a real clarity in terms of wanting to support people who were who were desperate who ha who needed help and support there and then and it's really interesting as that emerged commu the community in um, in North Kensington in the area where the tragic uh, uh, tragedy uh, the Grenfell tragedy happened that continued so communities have found their voices and they actually want to use their voices to actually kind of uh, challenge uh, but also to to provide services so i think it's a really interesting dynamic that we're seeing there because they have actually come together they are dictating as a community what needs to happen at grassroots level we as organizations are on the outside so we have to wait to be invited to be part of that conversation and it's a very interesting uh, a dynamic to actually see and to experience and it, it makes me think in terms of how we engage our communities and to what extent we engage uh, our communities. We engage them around our agenda. And that, you know, regardless of how much we do around engagement to our communities, it's always about a service or an activity. What do you think of this service or how we can improve this service? You know, that's not going to help us deliver the, the transformation that we need for integrated care agenda. That's, that, that's going to help us so far in tinkering with the current uh, 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 system. If we're going to really create integrated health and care system, we need a paradigm shift in how we commission and deliver services. That requires a completely new conversation and relationship with our communities that's based on their needs. Uh, 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 so, I think, so I think the whole idea of whether it's engaging with hard to reach group or sometimes what we call easy to, get, to ignore rather than hard to reach, um, we, need, we really need to rethink our engagement, not only in terms of how we engage them, but the type of conversation we have with you our communities. You just identified something there really important, which is language, which I don't yeah. know if we're going to come on to, mm -hmm. but, you know, and I I really, I'm really glad you reframed it mm -hmm. away from hard to reach, yeah. because that's defined, in my experience, by uh, people within organisations defining how they perceive patients, public communities to be, when as you've said very, uh, when you said earlier on, you know, th th they've been knocking at the door often, yes. trying to be engaged and involved. One final thing, I, Dan, I think you're spot on. I think it's so easy if we're not careful mm. to say that this particular group, because they've, they've always showed up, because of potentially, because of the, 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 the office and opportunities that have been put on the table, they're the ones who've, who've been showing up in terms of wanting to support engagement within the system it's very easy to then create another us and them and yeah. say actually we don't want you we want somebody else and it's about both and it's about how do we collaborate and partner and how do we work with the mm. challenge of working with everybody yeah i think that's for me there's a real question i mean so we haven't talked about methods but that's a really important mm. thing which is just to pick up on samira's point i do uh, you know i get that point about how do you do it differently but also there's, a, there's an equity argument as well and an inequality argument. So we have something like the GP patient survey, which is traditionally seen as a patient experience survey. And really interesting for me is not seen in the patient engagement field. And we might come on to this because I think we make false distinctions mm -hmm. between patient experience, between patient engagement. Mm -hmm. Often patient experience will sit within often a nursing directorate within a trust. Mm -hmm. um, the patient engagement will often sit within a comms function. And actually you think, well, have you spoken to each other is the first question. So if anything came out of this would be, how do you speak to each other? Because it's all about learning. On the GP patient survey, there's a 30% variation between access, with, between experience of access across CCGs. So for me, it's not just qualitative or quantitative or individual conversations. It's about using an appropriate range of methods. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the things with surveys is really interesting. You often show the results, and people say, well, they don't tell you why. And you're like, no, they don't tell you why. That's the next step for you to go away and find out, well, which groups are saying that? Which groups are saying that more? Which groups are saying that less? And that's when you move into more of the conversations and the qualitative work that would help you unpick why is this happening? Why is it happening more to this group than another? So I think there's an inequalities agenda here as well. Mm -hmm. If you look at many of those surveys, they're picking up quite significant inequalities. Can I just add to Lily? Yes. So I think there's something really, there's a powerful thread that's run through what everybody's mm -hmm. said. That, so just thinking back to that original question about uh, people who are prepared to be on those formal uh, patient and public mm -hmm. involvement groups. So just as Dan was saying, actually don't, don't worry too much about any one individual method. Look at all of the information you're getting from all of the methods you use. So I think the heart of how do we engage more people in the idea of being involved and playing an active role in the system isn't so much about any one committee or formal group. It's about across the board, how can we make sure that all of the population are linked in to these discussions and, and decisions. So for me, a lot of that comes back to looking at what motivates people to give up their time. Uh, and in this uh, arena, it's generally because they, they have had some motivation if something has happened to them or to their family or to people in their community that they want to help make sure the learning is taken from and things are improved. So there's that sort of fairly concrete um, uh, motivation or in the kind of situation that Samira was describing around Grenfell, people who feel really strongly that their communities have historically not been listened to and feel that they can be part of changing that. You have to work with those motivations and instead of saying, who would like to play this defined role in this defined structure, say, here are a whole range of ways that you can help make a difference. Talk to us about which of those would, would work for you. And there's learning to be had there from the, you know, the wider volunteering sector uh, about what motivates people to be volunteers and what's help, what helps them to be effective as volunteers. And you know, there's a lot of thinking going on across the NHS at the moment about bringing new uh, complementary volunteering roles uh, into the NHS. So you know, we need to join up, just as Dan was saying, join up the nursing directorate and the comms directorate around this. We need to be thinking about human resources and support for volunteering uh, and making sure that um, helping services to learn and change and improve is just as valuable a volunteering activity as the really important stuff around you know, ward level support for, for feeding or whatever it might be. So, so I've got two challenges in a way. One of the challenges around um, um, the, the lay partner or the, the, I absolutely agree. I think we have to honor and value the contribution that, uh, that, these, that these people are willing to give. They give up their time, their, their, their energy, their capacity, their expertise to help us. But they also become part of the system. Mm -hmm. They are the system, they speak our language, they reflect in our, in our image. And therefore, to what extent, uh, I've had many conversations with lay, our lay partners where they have a phenomenal amount of understanding about what ICS and STP is, that you become the system. So how do we become mindful that they don't become our biggest almost kind of um, spokespeople rather than actually have an independent lay perspective. The second is around the patient experience and whether it's the GP patient experience or all the other surveys is how representative are they of the diversity of the population. So if we are going to use them as a starting point for prodding or kind of thinking what next is to what extent the, those surveys are reflective. I mean my my experience uh, I, 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 when I worked as uh, assistant director of patient experience in North West London was the issue of the lack of data around experience, whether it's through complaints or through the patient experience from uh, BME communities for people with learning disabilities from the, the, the wider community. So to what extent we need to look at if surveys are not the right uh, methodology or right approach is how we complement that with another yeah. type of approach. I mean, that's a really good point, which is that's absolutely true. Yeah. And they don't represent, so cancer patient experience survey, BME communities underrepresented. And then it's about looking, well, what do we do? So it's not thinking that one method, and this is where the frustration comes, I think particularly with qualitative data, which is often, you know, in the past I've presented qualitative data, 
And the first question that gets asked is, well, how many people did you go to? And if it's 20 or 30, it's, well, well that's, not, that's not representative, that's not the right. But actually, sometimes one or two patient stories tell you everything you need to know about something. And that's one of my frustrations in this area, is that we're too quick to say, well, what's wrong with the data collection? So one of the people we spoke to for the work we've done recently said that the NHS reacts in two ways. One is it says, we knew that already, and the other one is, it's wrong. Uh, and that, for me, is the biggest frustration, which is there are all these different sources. There's work to do, There's particularly work to do around what colleagues here have said around people we're not hearing from. But we do collect a huge amount of information, and I think we're too quick to dismiss that. That's the wrong method. That doesn't give us this. That doesn't. Actually, no other organisation would think we just do one method and that will tell us everything. And particularly on things like, um, we haven't talked about public engagement, where it can get a bad name is that it's often only done as sort of set piece events. So we're going to change something, there'll be a reconfiguration of services potentially, and then there's a challenge. Now, the, the problem for that, we haven't talked about staff and how they receive that, is that if patient engagement is often seen as reconfiguration, that becomes quite a challenging conversation sometimes. And both sides become quite binary or quite fixed in positions. And that's where I think some of this has got a bad name, that it's often been around change. And certainly I've heard from quite senior NHS people that it can feel that they're almost afraid to go out to speak to people. Yeah. And on that point, so a few of you have touched there on methods, and I sort of really take the point that, you know, maybe we shouldn't get too bound up in methods, but we have had a question, and I think perhaps, Mark, you might share your thoughts up from on, on a question from Rosa Parker from the Community Southwark Partnership who says, can you explore some of the methods passed to engagement that are different from the PPG environment? Do you have any thoughts, thoughts on that? Is that it again? Thinking about some methods and paths to engagement that are different from the PPG environment, if we do want to sort of have a broader range of approaches, what might they be? I think I'm, I'm very struck by some work I've been doing recently with um, a, 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 a patient experience manager called Kate Hammond down in um, um, Belinda Cancer Centre down in South Wales, where she, for me, she models exactly how we can bring these different methods into being. The very, what she does is the question she asks herself continually is, in everything I do as a patient experience manager, how am I ensuring that patients, service users, their carers are at the centre of everything I'm doing? What can I do in order to have conversations and build relationships that enable them to partner and support me in delivering a service that absolutely makes a difference. So she continually tries to find ways, every day, in every way, she tries to find ways in which she can involve patients and service users in her work. And, and, and the thing that really helps is because she has been able to get with the, uh, the chair of her patient group and the, the, uh, the leader of the volunteers onto the board where they can have conversations at board level about how engagement works and how they should develop engagement within their organisation. So it's about, it's not just about methods, it's not just about uh, focus groups or, although as, as, as Dan says, these methods are all really important. Where it starts is what is the purpose? What are we trying to do with our patient involvement? Where are we trying to get to? What's our clear picture of the difference we want to make? And that clear picture of the difference we want to make absolutely needs to have an emotional as well as a heart component. And then once you start developing those relationships and conversations and you ask patients and service users continuously about how can we build and develop services that work for you, how can you be involved, methods will develop, will emerge from that conversation. Dan? Yeah, just to build on what Mark said there, that, you know, it, exactly heart and how you have that emotional, but there's also, let's be pragmatic, there's an efficiency question as well. So recently there's a patient that we spoke to, so been in receipt of 11 different services over the course of a week. So he was in receipt of all of those services at home, was having to wait for visits. Didn't really understand what each of those different services was doing, and in fact they weren't necessarily talking to each other. So that's a method where you're just trying to le just really learn through someone what the course of their week is like. Mm -hmm. 
and then the what that means. Now, the reality was this person wasn't going out, so their mental health was becoming impaired as a result of this. So that's the point where you start with the story and say, well, that just isn't working, and that actually a different way of approaching that. I think one of the interesting things about this area is that it's not, it can feel risky to some people, I think, in the NHS, and that's really important to acknowledge. So we, again, in our work in Wigan, um, they talked about the fact that depending on what you hear, there's a question about if what you hear, can you act upon it as a member of staff? And I think um, in Northwest London, there was a really interesting story recently, which was about a staff member that actually felt they had to listen to what was coming from up rather than from what the patient said. So the story was that this patient had um, a pain in their side um, and they went for an MRI scan, I think it was. Yes. And uh, the, they, the form said that the pain, they had to do the scan down here. And the patient said, well, the pain isn't there, it's here. And the, the person doing the scan said, well, yeah, but the form says I've got to do it here. And that for me, and they did the scan in the wrong place, which meant they had to go and redo it. Yeah. And that for me is a really interesting question, which is does the NHS allow staff agency to act upon what they hear from patients? I think that's a difficult question. Yeah. Uh, so it's interesting, this sense of agency and those who actually act on uh, on uh, uh, on uh, on what they feel they need to do rather than actually kind of what they're told to do and i just wanted to to um uh, uh, to tell the story of chad so chad is a gp in white city in hampstead and fulham so an area of high health inequality and uh, so um he he went for on a home visit and there was this elderly gentleman who was homebound multiple long-term conditions he was uh, he had lots of health and care needs and he um, he was quite depressed so when Chad went in to um, uh, to do his home visits he had two options he went in he could have done the I'm not a clinician so I don't know how to describe it he would have done his vitals you know blood pressure all sorts of things and for, for him that would have been as a GP he would have done his job he went in and then he said he said that he asked he said to him what do you want? What do you want? And in asking what you want, the elderly gentleman just looked at him and said, I just want to have my beard trimmed. That was his response. So Chad, in Chad's fashion, because he does have that sense of actually uh, uh, want uh, around social justice and wanting to do uh, something different, he had to phone a friend who phoned a friend who phoned a friend who came and actually trimmed his beard. He went to see him a, a three days later and he was a completely different person. And he said it was almost, it's the sense. So he's, he was a lot happier, so he was less depressed. His blood, sh his, uh, 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 his blood pressure was a lot better. So did his blood, his having his beard trim actually improve his outcomes, clinical outcomes? As far as Chad is concerned, yes, absolutely. So it did that. So what's the lesson from that story so for engagement and involvement across the wider... So I, don't, so I think we have to give our frontline staff permission and a sense of agency to act when they see the need to act. I mean, we have, we, we, mm. the way we're trying to uh, articulate this in North West London is through a range of stories, different narratives. I mean, I, I can go on. We've got Justin, who's a, who was a drugs and alcohol user for 30 years from the age of 14 to the age of um, uh, 44. Uh, and and then now he's giving back and he said to him he said in his in his film he said I can I can tell somebody I'm volunteering in a drugs and alcohol service but I know the next hostel that will take that person in what's the harm in me doing that and that's the the, the sense is to what extent we enable for that to happen at frontline and then we sort out the, the the challenges backwards rather than the other way around so that person who mentioned methods one of the things around methods mm -hmm. I think what Samira is saying is we can use narratives and stories mm -hmm. in really effective ways to really highlight ways we can do things differently. Right. And I think that's, that's what I'm hearing. Yeah. And that's really important. And, and, and it brings it alive. It makes people committed. It motivates people. It connects people. And, and if they are followed through and they don't just become 
stories that can be utilised to say, well, you know, let's slap ourselves on the back, we're doing a really good job here. If they're actually used and lessons and insights can be taken from those stories, they're hugely powerful for bringing about changes and insights about how we can do things differently. But it's also, sorry, just quickly, I just want to say it also creates a, a shift in thinking. It's those, those are the ones, when you capture those stories and you use them as a prompt for discussions, they shift the thinking because then I move from my position as a commissioner to somebody who has an interest in making beyond my organisation, in making things happen on the ground. So for us, what we're doing with those stories is using them to have wider conversation. They're an invitation for a much wider and a much bigger conversation. I think the real power of those stories is when, as Dan was saying earlier, when it shows people everything that's happening all the way through someone's journey through and around the system, not just one episode. Because mm -hmm. it's much harder for somebody to shift the system mm -hmm. when they're looking at someone's experience around one episode. When you get the right people around a table, I saw this at national level when Healthwatch did its first big project on people's experience of discharge from hospital. We had people who had spent 30 years at very senior levels you know, in the national system saying, of course I knew that, but I've never thought of that being connected with, with that before. So it's, it's making it systematic that people look at those stories right the way across where the power comes from. And I think if we looked at those stories, here's a, just something just to throw out, we would actually question the language we use. So discharge, is, it's really interesting how language is not sort of like neutral. I know a lot of people, including myself, who, que you know, quite interested about the term we use in terms of the discharge of patients through the system. Yeah, very, the process, yeah, so very yeah. mechanical. Yeah. So I think we're sort of coming towards the end of our time, so I wonder, and we've covered a lot of different issues, um, I wonder if I could ask each of you just to give me sort of your final thoughts and suggestions on what might need to happen next around patient and public engagement, starting with you, Neil. Um, well, I think that there is a, a huge opportunity now with the long-term plan to really model uh, to the whole system that you know, NHS England, NHS Improvement are really going through the plan and through their new regional structures to provide a steer to, you know, to trust to other organisations right across health and care uh, that it is, it's not only okay to do this, it's imperative to do this because unless this agenda gets the same focus from boards as the control totals do and the other financial issues and all of the other things that the regulators are, are concerned about, then it will continue to drop down the agenda. Uh, I think part of making that meaningful for people and uh, helping people to come forward and share their experiences in the way that you know, the system is trying to ask us to now is to uh, tackle that issue of the feedback loop uh, and make sure that people can see in concrete terms the difference it's making to services, but also the difference it's making to the relationship and how people see themselves becoming more and more powerful within the system. So that should be very easy to do in 10 years. Dan. So, I mean, I think uh, the discussion has been really good in terms mm -hmm. of covering lots of the, and there's some thorny issues here and we could, we could talk for longer. But I think there's the, it still feels like an appendix, this area. It still feels like something which is a bolt-on or, a, oh, we better go and do some patient engagement uh, that leaders... So, I, for me, it's back to the Wigan example, which is it's everyone's business throughout an organisation. Um, and moving that the issue from an appendix to the heart of an organisation seems key to me. For that one, just as a really practical suggestion, that as these integrated care systems set up, the first thing is everyone that worked on patient engagement engagement experience anyone that's working in this area in any of those 44 areas just to sit down in a room together and say what do we already know what are you doing how are you collecting this how are you because then you would start to have the conversation about what do we know together and bring these stories into play that Mark and Samira have been talking about. Samira. So, so in North West London, we've um, developed a, a, locally def uh, a local definition of integrated care systems uh, in collaboration with our patients and our communities and our frontline staff. And, uh, and it really, um, it took a lot of time to actually uh, come up with, uh, uh, with the definition. But what it came down to is that integrated care system is a, is a different way of behaving based on people, not buildings, based on outcomes, not on activities and procedures. 
communities. So the idea is how, if we are to connect with our communities and actually kind of develop the, if you like, a more collaborative agenda to address our uh, population health challenges, we really need to think about how we develop a longer term relationship with our communities. That's not based on how many events we did, how many meetings we went to, but what's the outcome? What is the outcome that really actually um, uh, we need to deliver? And if it's about addressing health inequalities, we really have to stop and think to what extent the different transformation, whether national or local, the different transformation programs that have existed over the last 10, 15 years have addressed our health inequalities agenda. Uh, so I think for me that's really critical. Um, if you start with the community, and if you work with communities, honestly, the, the solutions lie there. You just have to create the space and the environment for people to come together and you just nurture that, that space. Um, don't try to control it. Don't try to manage it. Uh, because if you do that, you destroy the, the intent within which it started. Thank you. And Mark, a few final thoughts from you. Um, I think I would go back to the NHS constitution and its values, which says patients are at the centre of everything we do. We should be partnering with patients and their communities. Um, so my question to people engaged in the NHS and, her, and the wider health care system is to reflect on what is your vision for ensuring that you're collaborating and partnering with patients and their communities in everything you do that they're at the heart of everything you do. And it could be a challenge. It could um, get you thinking differently. But, and then what is it you can do now? What one small thing can you do now in the next three to four hours when you leave this, 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 this conversation? What one thing can you do to put in place something that's different about engaging and collaborating and having a, maybe a different conversation? because it's about a relationship. Fundamentally, however we define engagement and involvement, for me, it's about the quality of the relationship we have with each other in the system in order to deliver the care we want. Thank you. Well, Mark's left us all with a challenge. <laughs> um, thank you very much to the panel and thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about some of the things that we've been talking about today, then you should be able to see some links and some resources on the page that you're looking at now. We're also planning to continue thinking about some of these themes on the second day of our annual conference in November. So again, please check out the link and our website for further details. I'm afraid we've run out of time, so uh, thank you again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at the next of our online events. Goodbye.